writing, writing is a lot like feeding birds. No, it's like. I know what writing is like. Writing is a lot like slicing apples. No, it's not that either. I've got it. I know what writing is like. Writing is like stacking wood. Making a wood pile. Now, it's not the greatest analogy in the world, but I, I think in a minute, if you just let me talk here for a little while, you'll see that it really is. What's on my mind for this lesson, as we start moving back towards style, is the thinking of a very famous rhetorician from North Dakota, if you can believe that or not. Uh, his name is Francis Christensen, and he wrote an elegant little book called Notes Towards a New Rhetoric uh, a few years ago. And what I'm thinking about here is his essay, The uh, Generative Rhetoric uh, of the Sentence. Uh, there's five essays in that book, and uh, I, I, I just am uh, I'm fond of the book. It's really taught me a lot about writing for, for my own writing and about things I want to share with my students. I should mention, too, that his wife helped him write this uh, back in the 60s, but I'm, I'm not remembering uh, her name. Francis Christensen has this idea called generative rhetoric that he kind of borrows from this uh, guy named Paul Roberts in the early 60s, and you really don't need to know who he is. Uh, he wrote a book called English Sentences, which is also uh, elegant. But uh, Christensen has uh, four rules for writing that I think are worth talking about. And I've been talking about them in my face-to-face -face classes, and it's probably time you heard about it. It's part grammar, part style, and it'll probably take a couple videos uh, to, to get his theories to you. Francis Christensen uh, really corrected a, a wrong idea I had about writing that I used to uh, talk about when I was a young man. I used to walk into classes and say, uh, you know what? Uh, you need to plan your sentences out from one end to the other. I'd stand there at the age of 30, even younger, 28, 29, 30 years old, I'd stand in my old classrooms and say, you know what, if you don't know where you're going, you're never going to get there. And my students would ponder that, like that was really deep or something. You know, how ridiculous. I didn't know that that's not how students write. No one sits down and looks at a sentence and says, I think I'm going to begin this with a participial, then I'm going to put a comma, and then I'm going to put a conjunction medially, and possibly a semicolon for another independent clause. Nobody thinks like that. What happens when we write is we put a pen down. And as you, as you've heard me use this analogy before. We just kind of grope up this alley. We add one word to another. We just sort of go, right? And we don't really know where the sentence is going to end up any more than we know where the paragraph will end up or the paper. Francis Christensen teaches me to teach you that writing is generative. You generate words on a piece of paper or on a screen, and in the generating of that meaning, you generate your own knowledge. You discover uh, really much more accurately than plan what you're going what you're, what you're to uh, think or learn. Um, now, uh, what I'll use here is my wood stove, my wood boiler, uh, to project uh, the rules that Francis Christensen gives us for writing. A couple of them are pretty easy. Uh, a couple of them are a little bit more complicated. And let's start with rule one. Rule one, according to, to Christensen, is that writing is a process of addition. To write, you add one word to another. Now, that's dead simple, right? You, you know that. You've got to add one word to another, and I've been here before with you. If you add enough of those words together eloquently, you get a sentence. Splice together enough sentences together, and hopefully you get a coherent paragraph, and so forth. It's about the control of units of meaning. That's easy to understand. You know you've got to add one word to another. The second rule is a little bit more difficult. Christensen says that writing involves the uh, control or the modification of movement. This one's a little bit trickier. If you pick up a newspaper or pick up an essay, your eyes are going to go left or right across the uh, prose on the other side of the planet in Semitic languages. Maybe you know that Arabic's read backwards. But we write from left to right across the page. And you have probably the mistaken idea that meaning only goes left to right. Well, that's not necessarily true. Meaning can also reflect back, and you've got to be aware of that. One of the quickest ways to make it go the other way is with punctuation, right? A colon, 
throws meaning forward in a sentence. And you've got to watch it with colons. Yeah, I know you think that they just offset items in a list, but you've got to be careful. You can knife someone with a colon. Colons can be really mean. The dash, meanwhile, reflects the meaning back. It sends the meaning the other way, right to left, the opposite way. I can say, uh, uh, there's one school that I absolutely love, colon, Central Lakes College. I could also say, Central Lakes College, dash, one of my favorite schools in the whole world. The meanings flip the other way. Uh, so we've got rule number one, writing is a process of addition. We've got rule number two, it involves the control of movement. Number three is where it gets a little bit complicated. Francis Christensen says that writing involves the control of abstraction. And here's where English gets a little bit amazing to me. When, when we write, when we write, we fill syntactic slots, right? We fill them with words. But what's unusual to me, or astonishing to me, is that English has almost no synonyms that mean the same thing. There's almost no two words in English that mean the same thing. We can think about abstract words, uh, sort of on the high end, something like freedom, uh, something like democracy. That's, that's abstract. This is, is my wood boiler. That's pretty concrete. I, I can touch it. But every choice that you make semantically in the filling of syntactic slots is a choice between either more abstract or more concrete. Uh, I've also got to tell you something discouraging here. Let's look at this excerpt from uh, uh, As I Lay Dying, a novel by uh, William Faulkner, a writer so important to me I named my second son after him. In this passage, uh, where Addie Bundren speaks from the grave, she starts talking about how inadequate words are. When she says, and I'm citing this from memory, we'll get you the real story for the, so, that, so that you can look at it. When she says, that's when I learned that words weren't any good, uh, that they don't, ever, don't mean what they're trying to say at. Addie was telling us that language is inadequate, and you need to know that too. Um, every word that you choose to try to uh, communicate a thought or a feeling is probably going to fall short. We, we have to face that fact. When I say to my son Jeff, or say to my son Will, or say to my wife, I, as I do every day, I say, I love you, I love you. But, and I know you do the same, you have people that you love, but we use that word so much that sort of the burnish, it, it just gets sort of worn off of it like a coin. We say it all the time, but we really don't, I mean, does that really communicate what we feel? When I say to my, my son, the cameraman, when I say, hey, I love you, son, um, I'm really saying, I would go into a burning building for you. Uh, I would do Lord knows what for you, you know, but you freaks kids out if you say that. So you just sort of say, love you, and they say, I love you back, and, and, and it's, you're just going to sort of miss. But we try. We use language, and, and, and we, we try. Uh, we use language uh, uh, to pray in all the faith traditions of the world, but Allah, uh, uh, Yahweh, and God, well, guess what? They live outside space, time, and language. What are we even thinking about when we pray? Well, you know, some of us try. Uh, I was goofing around with my students, too, on, uh, not too long ago, thinking about this difference between concrete words and abstract words. I'll be honest with you, and don't tell your mother this. In early September, I was whipping up uh, 371 to uh, serve your colleagues up there as a teacher. And i got to tell you something. I was really wailing. I was going maybe 74, 75, clipping along pretty good. Four lane, you know, lots of sky. Uh, very beautiful drive. Got a little absent-minded, and I looked up as I was telling your classmates up there in my face-to-face -face classes. I'm driving along, and I look to the left, and there was a highway patrolman. Okay, I thought, I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm speeding. But instead of pulling me over, he just looks at me with these teardrop sunglasses and just does this with his thumb, right? Just turn it down, man, that's what he meant. That was his rhetoric. And I'm riding along, and I thought, that's a really good idea. That is a good idea. I'm going to do that now. And I just took the foot off the gas and just eased back you know, 68, 69 miles an hour, and, and look at how I just told you the story. I said, highway patrolman. I used a very concrete word. But when I taught this humble lesson uh, not too long ago in my face-to-face classes, I said, give me synonyms for highway patrolman. And they just started rattling them off, okay? Uh, somebody said, po-po, uh, even though there were law enforcement officials in the room. Somebody said, pig. I heard bacon. I heard 5-0, I think. Officer Obi is what I chimed in. Nobody wanted to hear that. Uh, 
um, the long arm of the law, if you want to use a figure called synecdoche, you know what's going on here. We had a whole bunch of words in a hurry, and they either moved towards the concrete, like police officer, or po-po. I would call that an abstraction. Every single use word that you use, according to Christensen, is either going to be a choice towards the concrete or a geared up choice uh, uh, towards the abstract. You're never going to say perfectly what you feel or what you mean, but you're going to try. We're all trying in Comp 1. Uh, and I'm calling you on you to be writers, and I'm calling on you to try. The last rule of Francis Christensen is that writing has texture. Prose can be dense or it can be loose. Uh, think macrame, think wool, think cotton, any fabric. Uh, it's, it's not the worst way of thinking about writing. And in our next lesson, now that we've covered these four rules of writing, of Francis Christensen. Uh, writing is a process of addition. Writing involves the control or modification of movement. Uh, writing uh, uh, involves the control of abstraction or concrete stuff. Uh, and writing as texture. In the next lesson, I'm going to demonstrate texture for you. And uh, probably in the lesson after that, uh, I've got some things to tell you about what he teaches us about the sentence. Um, the great news is that if you write in the right way, if you know how to control free float and modifiers in a sentence, quite unlike us, a sentence never has to die. And William Faulkner proves that and Go Down Moses and Absalon Absalon, where there's sentences that go on five, six pages. I bet you get kind of nauseous just thinking about that. Hope you got your wood cut for winter. I do.